Well, welcome to the program. America is a medicated culture and it's leading millions into addiction. And that addiction is costing the country more than $600 billion a year. And it's not just a financial cost. Addiction is destroying lives. Stephen McWhorter was a teenager when he tried his first joint. And then marijuana turned into cocaine. And then cocaine turned into meth. And soon, Stephen's addiction had ruined his life. I'd been up for like three or four days. It was kind of just a subtle on the ride home moment where it just dawned on me. And I said, wow, okay, this is it. I'm gonna die. This is it. This is what's gonna kill me. But it wasn't enough to scare me into quitting. When I was 13, I got into bands. I started playing music. When I was 16 or 17, I was the house band for a dive bar. <laughs> That's when I started kind of turning to the cigarettes, which went to alcohol, and just escalated to smoking marijuana, to selling marijuana. You would end up in places where somebody would be like, hey, smoke that with me, and I'll share this with you. Next thing you know, you're in a room and you're doing a drug that you've never done before. Then it just became who I am to me. You know, it just became what I do. But the day that somebody said, hey, try this, and it was crystal meth, that was, that was all she wrote. I was like, this, I, I love this. It made you feel good. It made everything seem fun and exciting. It made everything seem like it was okay, even though you knew it wasn't. It took over, um, aggressively took over. I stopped caring about music. I stopped caring about things that really meant a lot to me. You know, people would come up and say to me, man, you are like skin and bones. What's going on? And I weighed 100 to under 100 pounds. I was literally a walking skeleton. If there was ever a point where I was not high and I had any moment of clarity about my life, what was going on, it was horrifying. <laughs> and I just instantly and quickly wanted to go get high again. Because with the drug, you just start deteriorating. And you don't even realize it until you look up and you're like, what happened? Everything is dark. Everything is dark falling apart around me, but I can't stop doing this. It was kind of just a subtle moment where it just dawned on me. And I said, wow, okay, this is it. I'm gonna die. This is it. This is what's gonna kill me. Uh, my sister was, was intensely burdened to pray for me through just, I think, a great deal of prayer. My brother-in-law came to me and gave me this book called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And I accepted it. I don't even know why. It was like, you know, three in the morning. I was reading this book. And even in this dark spot as I was reading it, and I just felt the truth. I just felt the presence of God in the room. The false joy and happiness that I was trying to fill for all those years on crystal meth, I felt that night in the presence of God. And in that moment, I said, okay, God, if you're real, and I, and I believe you're real, I'm gonna go as far as to say, let's say you're real, Jesus is real, um, I will give you my entire life, I will stop everything, but I don't know how, I don't know how to quit all this. This is all I've ever been, I can't imagine who, me apart from it. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. In a thought that was more powerful than words, I felt him say to me, you don't have to, I will. I just knew, I was like, he's gonna do this. This is real. He can really save me. This is gonna happen. I just knew that I knew. And I quit everything overnight. What had been a drive to find my next high had now become a drive for God. I just wanted to meet him again. I wanted to keep going after him. I started wanting to express myself and this, this joy and this thing that I'm, I'm realizing. The ability, the gift, the love for music, he, he brought it back and started allowing me to write music again. And today I get to write music full time, Christian music, worship music full time. I get to lead worship, itinerary worship leader, traveling around all the time. What's amazing with that is just like only God, only God could have done that. I can't take no credit for any of that. This soul wants to
I experienced the Zephaniah 317 God, uh, which has become kind of my life verse, is that the Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He, he delights in you greatly. He quiets you with his love, and he rejoices over you with singing. And from that night in that room, I realized that God was able to pull me out of the wreckage, this God, the God who saves. So when I read that line that says, he rejoices over you as singing, that he sings over me <laughs> as a musician is so powerful to me. There's no such thing as too far for God. <laughs> there is no such thing as too far for God. He reaches to the, the lowest and he redeems. The Bible says, I made my bed in hell and behold, you were there. Think of that kind of love that no matter where you are, wherever you're struggling, he'll go to you. The Gospels record a time where Jesus took a specific trip across the Sea of Galilee to the Gadarenes, which is a uh, Gentile town. It was Greek and Roman town. Specifically to find a demoniac in chains in a graveyard to set him free. That's what Jesus does. He leaves the 99 to find the one. Now, so often in life, particularly if we're doing things that we know are wrong, but we can't stop, and that's, that's what happens in addiction. You can't stop on your own. You know, it starts off all innocently, you take a drug, and then before you know it, the drug is taking you. And just like Stephen, it becomes part of your life, where it is you, and all you want to do is chase that next high, and that's all you do. And so just like the demoniac, you're in chains to that. You go live under a bridge for that. You go live in a graveyard if that's what it takes because you can't break free. And in that, you start thinking, oh, God doesn't want anything to do with me. There, there's no way out for me. I, I can't get free of this. It's, it's part of me. It's part of my every day. It's part of uh, my thought process every single day. But I've got good news for you. God's not mad at you. He is able to change you. And what he did for Stephen, he'll do for you. If you just let him. Now, here's the life verse for Stephen. He says, this is the God that I, I worship. This is he. It's from Zephaniah chapter 3. The Lord your God in your midst. Now, just start thinking about that. He's in your midst. Did, did you make your bed in hell? And behold, he's there. He's in your midst. He's in the bar with you. He's there. He's, he's everywhere. He's in your midst. The mighty one will save. Nothing is too hard for him. There's no way that you've gone beyond his grace, beyond his love. You can't escape because that's him. When we're faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So the mighty one will save. How do you get that? Well, just like Stephen, you asked for it. I love his prayer. He said, Jesus, okay, you're real. You're here. I don't have a way out of this. I can't imagine life without doing drugs. I can't stop but I need you. Can, can you find, can you show me the way? And I love God's response to him. I'll take care of that. I've got that.
I can change you. I can make you new again. And when you come to him and you ask for that, Jesus says, the angels in heaven rejoice. Zephaniah says, God himself rejoices over you with gladness. And then all the turmoil, all the, the things that have gone wrong, everything you're ashamed of, he'll say, I'll quiet you with my love. And he'll rejoice over you with singing. Just like a mother rocking a child, singing over the child. That's what God wants to do for you. If you just let him, if you just say yes, Lord, I surrender. I surrender all. I don't want my way anymore. I want your way. I want to be free from these chains. I want to walk clean and I want to live for you. If you do that and you do that with all of your heart, you'll find him and you'll be free For who the sun sets free is free indeed.